All right, tonight we're going to look at what's known the highway of holiness from Isaiah chapter 35. Uh, <laughs> Ten verses that we're going to kind of look through, but uh, basically we're talking about verse 8. That's what I'm going to read in the first part of verse 8. Isaiah writes, And a highway shall be there, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The highway of holiness that uh, Isaiah speaks of is really an analogy, and it's based on the return of the children of Israel uh, after 50 years of Babylonian captivity. And it's clear, it's a clear reference to the coming of the Christ and of the establishment of the church kingdom. So uh, lots of times there, there are dual prophecies in the scriptures, but sometimes there's uh, with those dual prophecies, you'll see an example from the Old Testament, but it'll have New Testament implications, and that's what we're talking about here. But what this whole text, uh, verses 1 through 10, talks about is the rejoicing uh, that the children of Israel are going to do about 536 B.C. when Cyrus allows them to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple, at least they get started on rebuilding the temple, but they get to go back home. It's been 50 years since the destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple, and uh, some of them, like Daniel, had been carried away about 20 years earlier. So, you know, Daniel's still living down at this time and lives down through another round of, uh, of emperors, so to speak, another empire. Uh, He's got to be like 70 years old at least, and, and older than that. He's probably getting up into his 90s, and still a lot of prophesying that, that he's going to do. But he doesn't go back. A lot of the children of Israel then go back to what they refer to as Mount Zion, because that's where they remember the temple, and they've been longing to go home. Some of them, like I say, have been there for 50 years in captivity. Some of them were born in captivity, and they've heard the stories about Jerusalem. They've heard the stories about the temple and how grand it was. So there are a lot of things on their mind, but being freed from captivity and heading home, you can just imagine that their voices were ringing. They were singing songs, victory songs, you know, songs of praise to God because they get to go home. They get to go back where they wanted to be. They get to leave that nation of idols and idolatry. Now, Isaiah wrote this passage actually 200 years before this happens, and over 700 years before Christ came. That's a long time, uh, but that's one of the ways we can are sure of the Bible. It, it gives us a good foundation of prophecies that have come to light. You know, how could they do it? And, you know, some scholars will say, well, that was written after it happened, you know, if it was put in it. But you cannot have anything uh, in the Old Testament written after 200 because they made the Septuagint translation about them. So we have partial, I guess, uh, uh, manuscripts of that Septuagint version that have the very same thing that our Bibles have today, 200 years before it happened. That's amazing. And now we look at Isaiah again, 700 years before it happened and the New Testament fulfillment. So uh, it's amazing. The joy that he's speaking about of these people returning to their home, to Jerusalem. Think about us as Christians traveling through this fallen world, this, this land that we live in, even as great as, as America is, it's still a fallen world, and it's a world of idolatry, and we're on our way home walking through this land. Let's break down what Isaiah is saying here and try to get some understanding of what's going on. What Isaiah is talking about is this will be a time of great spiritual healing. 
there's going to be a returning to the Lord. You can imagine these people, they're kind of giving up because it's been 50 years in captivity and, and, and they've been so unhappy being there and, and watching the people worship their idols and at times trying to be forced to worship idols, the great statue. Uh, worship the king. Pray only to the king or you're going to be thrown into the lion's den or thrown into the fiery furnace. See, those things were happening to these people and a lot of them were kind of giving up. But what Isaiah is trying to tell them, explain to them, is they were going to be seeing the world in a totally different way light, this great time of spiritual healing. And once they're here healed spiritually, the world looks different to them. It's not the same as it was before because hope is, has been instilled back into their hearts. Look at verses 1 and 2, Isaiah 35. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it. The majesty of Carmel and, and Sharon, they shall see the glory of the Lord and the majesty of our God. We're talking about a barren spiritual landscape where there's not a whole lot going on for God because the children of Israel were being punished because of what they had done in Israel that so many years earlier. And he's saying it's like going through the desert and as you're walking through there, all of a sudden everything just blossoms and blooms and it's, it becomes like a, a garden or a rainforest maybe. Those who knew God or those who know God are going to be strengthened. That's one of the promises that's here. Look at verses 3 and 4. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. The feeble knees, the weak hands. Like I say, a lot of these people were older and they remembered what it was like back in their homeland. And they yearned to go home. They yearned to go back to Jerusalem where, where God supposedly dwelt. And they could renew their spiritual lives. Really, they needed to be renewed where they were they needed to repent and, and turn to God so that he could bring them back. But he tells them to be strong. The Lord will come with vengeance. Remember, the Babylonians were destroyed by the Medo-Persians. And that's how they really got to come back as Cyrus takes over as the new emperor of the Medo-Persian Empire. God took vengeance on the nation that that punished them for their idolatry and for their wicked ways. And here they are, they're heading back, and you just have to think, is this a dream? Is this really true? Am I going home? Are my prayers being answered? Did you ever watch a fight? when one of the fighters just got beat up so bad they call him punch drunk, right? He doesn't know where he's at. <laughs> he, he can't lift his arms. He, his knees are wobbly. And he said, well, you know, where am, I, where am I? What's going on? And that's kind of like they felt because this is all of a sudden they get to go home. Now the New Testament talks something about this for for us at the time when we find salvation. Ephesians 4, 15 to 14, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. 
Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. You see, once we learn that our sins have condemned us to a devil's hell for eternity, and then we discover that God has provided a way of salvation for us. It's so amazing that we're like that punch drunk fighter. Is this real? Can, can, can it really be true that God would forgive me and take me back and put me on the road to home? To home with Him and what an amazing thing. See, it's a great time of spiritual healing. Just going home, just setting up homes again, just, just getting back to normal course of business in their day. No. Those things happened. It was a time of great spiritual healing. It was also to be a great time of spiritual healing for those who trusted in God to be renewed. They're going to be strengthened, and now they're going to be renewed. Those who trust in God will be renewed. Isaiah chapter 35, verse 5 through 7. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool, and the thirsty ground springs of water. And the haunt of jackals, where they lie down, the grass shall become reeds and rushes. Where do rushes grow? Where, where do cattails grow? Where there's water marshy water, ponds, lakes, whatever. And the wilderness is going to turn into that. The land was going to be renewed, but, but look, they're going to be renewed too. And again, think of it in spiritual terms. The eyes of the blind shall be open. Here they are for 50 years. Where's God? Where's God? I, I'm suffering here in this land of idols, and look what they're making us do, and, and we can't worship God freely as we want to. Where's God? He was there all the time, wasn't he? He was just waiting for the right time to bring them back, and all of a sudden their eyes are open. We're going home. We're going where we want to be. We're going back to Jerusalem. But there's no doubt that this is really talking about the coming of the Messiah. When, yes, the eyes of the blind were opened, the deaf ears were opened, there was healing taking place. Why? So, so God could show us what heaven's going to be like. Where there'll be no sickness, there'll be no dying. It's, it, it's over once we get there. So it's with great joy that we walk on that highway of holiness. Now, there's some things about this new way of holiness that, that should strike us. Strike us as, as very important and, and very moving. Uh, Isaiah 35, verse 8, And a highway shall be there. Where? Well, that's out in that wilderness, isn't it? Remember, from, from Babylon, from modern-day Iraq, over to Jerusalem, where there's mountains and the Jordan River flowing down through there, it's desert. But that's going to be somewhat of a, a garden type pathway for them to tread over there. So for them, a highway shall be there, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. It shall belong to those who walk on the way. Even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. And I believe the King James Version says, wayfaring fool. Wayfaring fools will not uh, pass on. They're not going to get there. But the, the thing is, God's going to provide this highway. God's going to make it possible. And they had to see that through the prophecy of Isaiah. 
and then the prophecies of Daniel as he's dealing with these leaders of Babylon and then Medo-Persia as he's bringing it to their attention. Hey, God mentioned you, Cyrus, back in the book of Isaiah. And look, God has a purpose for you to let these people go back. God was opening up the way for them to go home back to where they're supposed to be leaving that land. God provided the way for them as God has provided the way for us. John 14, verse 6, and Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The way that God had provided for his people to come come to him, to come back to him. To, and when we talked about John the baptizer this morning, what was his purpose? To return the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. And there was going to be a great uh, renewal of the people in the time of John so that they would be ready when Christ came. To see, before they could even get to that point, they had to get back to Jerusalem, didn't they? And they had to get back to Jerusalem. They had to rebuild that temple. Why? Because the prophecies say that when the Messiah comes, he'll come to his temple. It had been destroyed. It had to be rebuilt. So joyously, they're looking forward to the things that, that we now enjoy. Think about it, you know, this, this new way that's being provided. How often do you see, especially in the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus says, You've heard you have heard it said of old times, and uh, heard it said of old, and you've heard it said, but I say to you, it really wasn't anything different. It was just a higher standard, a greater way of holiness that was bringing them through to come to the Father. So under the Old Covenant, they could only come so far. But the New Testament brings them the rest of the way, brings us the rest of the way to God also. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 6, He is the mediator of a better covenant which was established upon better promises. Hebrew writers writing to Christians who were basically Jewish who wanted to go back to Judaism. Some Hebrew writers say, why would you want to go back there? You've got something better. It's a whole lot better. It's the new way. It's the new highway of holiness that God has provided for you. Some other things we notice, the unclean shall not pass over it. And in a sense, we would say that Israel has been cleansed of her sins because they had gotten into idolatry. They went over to a land of idols. They found out what it was like. When they come back, they didn't get involved in idolatry anymore. Did you realize? They were very, very stringent in staying away from idolatry. Of course, they, they kind of set up their own understanding of the law that led to some, some principles that were, but yet the unclean shall not pass over. Only those cleansed through Christ's atonement can enter and walk on this new highway of holiness that we're looking at. Okay? We have to be cleansed. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 through 14, But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, parentheses, not made with his not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not like the old tabernacle, not like the temple that was built with men's hands, but a new structure not made without hands. Tip you off. That's talking about the church that Jesus is building his church out of, as Peter says, living stones. You and I are living stones in this new building. 
and he talks about it here. He entered once for all into the holy places, not the ones made with hands, but the holy place in heaven. He's entered there, not by means of the blood of goats and of calves, but of, by means of his own blood, thus securing and, look at those words, eternal redemption. Not well, you're going to live maybe for a thousand years here on this earth again, and, and if you do good, then you'll get a second chance of going to heaven. No, 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 that's not what it's about. Not even cycles and dispensations of things, but providing for us at the end of this highway of holiness an eternal redemption that will never be taken away from us if we walk on that highway. But listen, we can't do it as unclean persons. We've got to be cleansed by the blood of Christ and continue to be cleansed as we walk through this life. Second, or thirdly, I guess it is, it, it's, it's for the repentant. And it's referring again to Isaiah 35, verses 5 through 7. But, but if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, the Apostle Paul mentions a whole bunch of terrible sins that were taking place, that had taken place in Corinth. And remember, Corinth is one of those cities of idolatry. Just as bad as Athens, just as bad as Ephesus, but morally even more corrupt. But, look at all those terrible sins down through there, and then look at the last of it. And Paul says, and such were some of you but you've changed. You've been cleansed. The uncleanness is gone. The sins are forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ. And now they could walk on this highway of holiness and they had to be careful because they were close to losing it, not because of these terrible sins, but because they didn't love one another. They were proud and they were choosing, oh, this I like this preacher, no one, I like this preacher, and we're going to follow Peter, or we're going to follow Paul, or we're going to, you know, whoever. And they forgot that they were following, they forgot it was Christ that cleansed them of their sins. So they started going in different directions. But look at the terrible sins there that Jesus forgave them of when they believed and followed him into the waters of baptism for the forgiveness of sin. Paul said, such were some of you that you've been changed. So this highway is for people who are repentant. They, they've changed. They've turned around and they are walking a new way. No wayfaring fools on this way. And this is like the fourth one that, that we're looking at here. And i got a lot of scriptures mentioned down through here. We're not going to read all of them, but look. The wayfaring fools. Now, what does it mean by a wayfaring fool? Now, see, in, in our way of thinking, sometimes our, our words are, are synonymous with other words. And it doesn't mean someone who can't understand, someone who's got a, a mental problem and can't understand God's way. So that's why I put the wayfaring fool here. This is one who despises wisdom. One who is a mocker, who, you know, oh, yeah, God's going to strike me dead for doing, put sin X in there. Okay. Or the mockers, you know, hey, he's promised to come back. Where is he? Uh, he's being patient, giving you a chance to repent but they're quarrelsome, and, and even more so, they're licentious. And you go to the book of Proverbs and look at the fool. What is he doing? He, he's just uh, meeting the passions of the flesh, whatever it is out there. Uh, but he despises wisdom. He despises anybody that tells him that he might be wrong. And that there's a better way because he thinks he's got made his way. But the wayfaring fools will not stumble onto this way. Won't stumble onto it. Won't kind of, you know, I know somebody that stumbled here 
recently. That was a total accident, wasn't it? Yes, they, dear. But <laughs> there ain't nobody going to get to heaven by accident. Heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. And the wayfaring fool will not get on this way. Why? First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 say, Fools do not find Christianity appealing. They think we're simple minded people because we believe in a God. We have morals and we have ethics and, and we live by a code. But they think we're fools for doing such. But who's the fool? Read it when it comes down to it. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3, faith. But it's, it's just not faith. It's a faith that's a developed faith. It's constantly in development. It's growing. That your faith may grow and get stronger as, as you go through this life, walking on this highway. Uh, repentance, Luke chapter 13, verse 3. And really it's verse 3 and verse, I think it's verse 5. And another verse, you know, what? Jesus giving examples. He's saying, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. So, yeah, it's for the repentant. Confession, both a verbal confession and a nonverbal profession in the way that we live our lives. It's just not saying, I believe in God. It's living like we believe in God and believe in Jesus Christ and believe what the Bible says. Romans 10.10, 10, confession is made, uh, for with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation and, uh, oh, I forget the rest of it. That's all. Anyway, you can look it up and it's fine. I wasn't going to quote it anyway. But <laughs> then the remission of sins, Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Remission of sins. Uh, the wayfaring fairy fool doesn't carry anything about his sins. you got to be serious. you got to be serious to listen to a gospel sermon that says you need to have your sins forgiven and to get into that water. There ain't no joking about it. It's the most serious thing that you can do ever. And it shouldn't be taken lightly. And continue in the way of holiness. First John chapter 1 verse 7. Continue to walk in the light as he is in the light. Where we, our sins are constantly cleansed because <laughs> we're not perfect. Not going to be perfect. Okay? We, we know our imperfections. We constantly pray for God to be merciful to us as sinners. Oh, here's a beautiful. This is beautiful. God's people are protected from the forces of evil. Remember what's said about the haunt of jackals? What are jackals? They're like wild animals that come out and attack, you know, and they're, they, they're running packs and they're just, just terrible animals. But don't have to worry about that. And look at Isaiah 35, 9. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast come upon it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. Now, the ravenous beast, of course, 1 Peter 5, 8. The devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. See, that's kind of like this, but, but you also have not just the devil and the demons, but you have people who choose to attack Christians. Now listen, physically they may attack us, try to get us to deny our faith. But if we remain on that highway of holiness, they can do what they want with this physical body. They're not, they're not going to kill the soul. What is that? Uh, Matthew 10? I'm thinking, I'm thinking 38. I could be wrong on it. Don't fear him who can kill the body, but not kill the soul. Kill him who can kill both body and soul in the fires of hell. That's the one to fear. Now, if we're on that highway of holiness, he's protecting us spiritually. He's protecting us from what's out there. Titus chapter 2 and verse 14. 
we it talks about the redemption, see? The redeemed are those bought back from slavery <laughs> to sin and death. Uh, the re, that he might redeem uh, for himself a, a people, see? And then we end up being zealous for good works. But he's taking us out of this fallen world. This, those who will believe and obey, putting us on that highway, redeeming us and giving us a glorious hope that is there. And listen, we might be, let me, let me rephrase that. We are redeemed as Christians from the effects of iniquity but not necessarily redeemed from the consequences. Okay? Uh, teaching prison, there were some prisoner well, offenders who were there, and, and they were kind of, you know, wondering, well, if, if, if I committed this act, uh, uh, this criminal act, and, and I was convicted and I sent to prison, but, but now I've obeyed the gospel and God has forgiven me. Why am I still here in prison? Why don't they let me go? Well, it's because now you're suffering the consequences of what you did. Yes, God will probably, Christ will probably take you on to heaven if you remain faithful, but you still have those consequences of sin. And, and sometimes, you know, if somebody kills someone, they can repent of that and be forgiven, but they may still face capital punishment as a consequence of that sin. So we have to rem remember to separate the spiritual from the physical in so many of these things. Romans chapter 6, verse 23, for the wages of sin is death. Boom, there it is. The wages of sin is death. We're probably all going to die unless Jesus comes back. And he forgot about yesterday, didn't he? <laughs> he? He forgot he was supposed to, I guess, come back yesterday. But, uh, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that's after the consequences here of this. Why do I have to die? Why do I have, why do I have to die? Because the wages of sin is death. And death is the path to get to eternal life. Except for those lucky few who are still alive when the Lord returns. So, Isaiah chapter 35 verse 10 And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and sign shall flee away. <laughs> Is there any doubt that's talking about not just the church, but but heaven. The end of the road. The end of the highway of holiness. Where we're headed for. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22 through 25. But you have come to Mount Zion. That's a figurative uh, picture of the church. And to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. That's the church once again. And to innumerable angels in festal gathering, <laughs> that's talking about in heaven, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of right, the righteous made perfect. They're righteous, but they're not perfect until death. And in the Hadean realm, spiritually, they're perfect now. And in the resurrected life, they're going to be perfect. And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time his voice should be heard. But now he has promised yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, find my place, 
I will, not, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things, of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made. Brothers and sisters, that's this whole universe. This whole universe is going to be shaken and it's going to be removed in order that the things that cannot be shaken, that's heaven, may remain. What a firm foundation God's throne sits on. It cannot be moved. This earth will be moved, it will be removed. So listen, think about how we as Christians should rejoice and praise God for this great salvation that's in Jesus Christ. If they could do it, if they could do it back in 536, five, or, yeah, 536, 535 BC, as they're returning to Jerusalem, we've got something greater to look forward to. And you know something? The walk on that highway of holiness to get to where we're going is pretty good also. It's yeah. a pretty good deal. Hey. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. If you have any, please let your request be made known as we stand and sing the invitation song.